Hi, welcome to uh, Macbeth Act 3. So at the end of Act 2, uh, in my previous lecture, I was talking about um, uh, how the play is showing that there's a kind of topsy-turviness. Things are upside down. Unnatural things are happening um, at all levels of the play, um, in the weather, um, in horses eating each other for example. And so we want to put that context, um, you know, like bring it like a little bit more to our consciousness as we think about um, Macbeth and what's going on with, with Macbeth, um, rather than just trying to read in terms of a character identification way, which I think is the way a lot of people read. I think it's the way people often read in book clubs. And there's nothing wrong with having book clubs or anything. But uh, I think if we're studying um, literature with a capital L, one of the things that, that we need to be attentive to is the various layers and, and, and um, uh, the, the various textures of the fabric of the text, right? And that's what a text means, is something woven together. Uh, uh, and so uh, Shakespeare does this amazing thing where he writes across classes, and so we get uh, lots of different layers and perspectives happening um, at once. So at this point in the play, of course, um, King Duncan has been murdered um, by Macbeth. Um, uh, they've murdered the murderers, but what has happened is um, the, the, the idea is that the people really behind the murderers are um, Duncan's sons, Malcolm and Donald Bain, who have fled to England and Ireland. Um, uh, and, and, and because they they fled, you know, fearing for their own lives. Uh, the story that uh, Macbeth is and has, that has kind of erupted in Scotland is that they fled because they were guilty of killing their father. Um, so the blame is being put on them. And we'll see that kind of parasite, that killing of parents idea showing up um, and uh, mirroring itself in, in uh, another situation as well here. So Act 3.1 um, opens with Banquo. And we know that Banquo kind of probably already knows what's going on uh, and that uh, Macbeth has been lying to him. Uh, and there's this little tiny speech that Banquo gives. Um, and he says, uh, Thou hast it now, King Cawdor Glamis all, as the weird women promised, and I fear thou placed most foully for it. So he's saying, I suspect that Macbeth is behind this. Yet it was said it should not stand in thy posterity. It's not going to be your kids, you know, that carry this on, but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. Uh, if there come truth from them, as upon thee, Macbeth, their speeches shine, why by the verities on thee made good, may they not be my oracles as well, and set me up in, in hope. But hush, no more. And so that's this like moment where, I mean, we see that even Banquo is like, well, all this true stuff happened to Macbeth, so why can't it happen to me as well? And he's sort of pondering, he's being seduced by, in, in a way, I mean, uh, maybe seduction is too hard of a word, but he's definitely pondering his own prospects and his own truth, just as Macbeth did um, earlier in the play. Uh, and then Macbeth comes in, uh, and Lady Macbeth comes in, uh, and there's some exchange going on. And, and we see that Macbeth is trying to kind of get some information on where he's going to be. Like, you're writing this afternoon, where are you writing? And uh, But you'll be back for dinner, right? That kind of stuff. Uh, uh, and then immediately after <laughs> Banquo leaves the room, uh, Macbeth calls in um, uh, 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 these um, men that he's apparently talked to the day before. Um, and uh, he says, bring them before us to his servant. Um, and he says, to be thus is nothing, uh, but to be safely thus. So. Like, you can't be anything unless you're safe. Uh, our fears and Banquo stick deep. And in his, and notice that he's using the hour now because he's king. So he's become king because Malcolm and Donald Bain fled. Um, and he's kind of the next in line. Macduff is around, but he's kind of being quiet at the moment. Um, and so Macbeth 
is next in line. And that's actually that's something I meant to mention a few minutes ago, is that in this kind of ancient time in Scotland, um, it wasn't necessarily the case that um, the right of king would pass from father into son necessarily. Um, now, we know that earlier in the play, Duncan named Malcolm as his successor before he was killed, right? Um, and so that might have lent people to believe that like, oh, maybe Malcolm had a stake in killing his father um, because he just wanted to get to be king faster. Uh, but just to let you know, um, like it, it was, it's normal enough that a different thane or a different um, uh, person who's not in a blood lineage would have become king at the time. Um, and so he's using the royal we, the our here, our fears in Macbeth, or sorry, our fears in Banquo stick deep, and in his royalty of nature reigns that which would be feared. Tis much he dares, and to that dauntless temper of his mind he hath a wisdom that doth guide his valor to act in safety. Like he knows that, that uh, he knows that Banquo knows things corrupt, shady things are going on, but Banquo is smart and he's going to play it safe, right? Uh, um, there is none but he whose being I do fear, and under him my genius is rebuked, as it is said Mark Antony's was by Caesar. He chid the sisters, so he meaning um, uh, Banquo, right? Uh, he chid the sisters when they first put the name of king upon me, and bade them speak to him. Then, prophet-like, they hailed him father to a line of kings. Upon my head they placed a fruitless crown, and put a barren scepter in my grip, thence to be wrenched with all the unlineal hand, no son of mine succeeding. So he's got this pity on himself. Like, I mean, like, he almost is like casting Banquo as somebody who's like, you know, trying to kind of like be an intercessor or like a plotter, like, oh, I want to see if that's what's going on for, for Macbeth. What about me? Um, uh, he says, if it be so for Banquo's issue, I've, I have filed, have I filed my mind? Uh, for them, the gracious Duncan have I murdered. And he's like, like, why would I, why should I have murdered Duncan just for Banquo's uh, offspring to become kings? What's in it for me? Uh, put rancors in the vessel of my peace only for them and my, mine eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man to make them kings, the seeds of Banquo kings? Um... Uh, and so he says, my eternal jewel, right? My soul. And so there's that, again, that kind of Christian uh, imagery going on that he's going, his soul is damned now because he's committed murder and he's done it apparently for Banquo's children. Um, and so here, this language of fate shows up again, uh, rather than so come fate into the list and champion me to the utterance. And then he tells who's there. And so there's this you know, tension between fortune and fate, right? And, and Macbeth trying to wrestle and ma maybe make his own fate, right? Um, and his, his ambition. Um, and so he calls upon fate to help him and to help change things here. Um, and then we get the murderers coming in here. Um, and, and that language of fortune and fate continues. Uh, Macbeth says, well then, now have you considered my speeches? Know that it was he in times past which held you so under fortune, uh, which you thought had been our innocent self. He's like, yeah, in the past, you know, you might have thought that me and Banquo were together and, and kind of oppressing you and your families. But no, no, no. It was, actually, it never was me. It was always Banquo the whole time. <laughs> uh, this I made good to you in our last conference, passed in probation with you, how you were born in hand, how crossed the instruments who wrought with them, and all things else that might to half, half a soul and to a notion crazed say, thus did Banquo. Um, and so he goes on here. Uh, uh, he says, I did so and went further, which is now our point of second meeting. Do you find your patience so predominant in your nature that you can let this go? Like, are you really going to let Banquo get away with this? Are you so gospeled to pray for him? Pray for this good man and for this issue, whose heavy hand hath bowed you to the grave and beggared yours forever. Are you going to stand for this? And again, there's that kind of Christian language showing up there as well. 
Um, and the answer the, the murderer has here is we are men, my liege, right? So that gendered element is coming back in. And look at how Macbeth turns that back on them in this next speech. Just like just the frequency of the word man, man men, manhood. I, the, in the catalog, ye go for men as hounds and greyhounds and mongols, spaniels, curs, shouse, water rugs, and demi wolves are clept all by the name of dogs. Thou valued file, distinguish the swift, the slow, the subtle, the housekeeper, the hunter, every one according to the gift which bounteous nature hath in him closed, whereby he does receive particular addition from the bill that writes them all alike. And so of men, right? So, yeah, you call yourselves men, but like, you know, they're like, in the same way that there's like a lot of different breeds of dog, you might be men. Um, right? And so... Uh, he's kind of putting them down here. Um, he's kind of mimicking some of Lady Macbeth's techniques and her rhetoric, like to persuade you to, to act in a certain way. Uh, not in the worst rank of man manhood, say it, and I will put that business in your bosoms whose execution takes your enemy off, grapples you to the heart and love of us who wear our health but sickly in his life which in his death were perfect. And so he's like saying like, I was the one who was always true to Duncan anyway. And like, we need to like, I'm going to put into your hearts like the, the ability to act against Banquo and to kind of become real men, right? Uh, uh, and so the murderers agree here. Um, they admit that Banquo was their true enemy. Um, and... Uh, they're going to go and, and do this deed. Um, and even before it's done here at the bottom of, um, at the end of Act 3.1, um, line 141 here, uh, it is concluded, Banquo, your soul's flight, if it find heaven, must find it out tonight. Right? If it goes to heaven, it might go to hell. Right? There's that kind of afterlife imagery showing up. So we're at 3.2 now. And we get Lady Macbeth and the servant, and she asks for Macbeth. And there, this is a really, really important scene, I think, in the play here. Because remember, earlier on in the play, they've been a very much a loving couple, right? They're very dear to each other. They're confiding in each other. Uh, Lady Macbeth sees it as her wifely duty to um, sort of like egg uh, Macbeth on to do the act, to be the man that he can be, to be all he can be, right, as a man. Uh, and uh, so this is Macbeth talking to Lady Macbeth um, uh, about Banquo and, 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 well, and about Duncan, right? And he says, we've scorched the snake, not killed it. She'll loose, she'll close and be herself whilst our poor malice remains in danger of her former too. But let the frame of things disjoint, both the worlds suffer before or ere we will eat our meal in fear and sleep in the affliction of these terrible dreams that shake us nightly. So again, that imagery of like, like sleeplessness showing up, right? Um, insomnia and the worlds are in joint and or, or disjoint here, um, and they need to suffer. Let them suffer until like 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 until we can actually get this stuff done. Um, uh, he says, "Better to be with the dead, whom we to gain our peace have sent to peace, than on the torture of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy." So here we are. We're the living. We've killed people. We've sent people to peace, and we're the ones who are suffering from it, right? And so he's doing that kind of wavering back and forth again. Uh, whom, uh, uh, he's, Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. Treason has done its worst, nor steel, nor poison, malice, domestic, uh, foreign levy, nothing uh, can touch um, him further. So, uh and, and, and he's kind of like, you know, going into this dark place. And, and what does Lady Macbeth do? She says, come on, gentle lord. Um, sleek over your rugged looks. Be bright and jovial among your guests tonight. Come on. Like, it's going to be. It's 
going to be okay, is what Lady Macbeth is saying. Um, and, and right back here, there's a kind of tenderness in Macbeth's language um, here. Uh, so shall I love, and so I pray you be you. Let your remembrance apply to Banquo, present him eminence both with eye and tongue, unsafe, while that we must ha lave our honors in these flattering streams and make our face faces visards to our hearts, disguising what they are. Um, and so again, he seems to be like, kind of like, it's not like, like so much like doubting what they've done, but he's just going to a dark place. Like, 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 I mean, we're the ones who are suffering because we're the ones who did the murder. Um, we have to wear masks over ourselves because we can't be honest and among these flatterers now. And, and, and Lady Macbeth says, you must leave this, right? You got to stop acting that way. Um, and Macbeth says, oh, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. Right? Still some tenderness here. Thou knowest that Banquo and his fleance lives. And Lady Macbeth says, but in them nature's copy not eternal. Uh, there's, and Macbeth says, there's comfort yet, and they're assailable. We can take them down, right? Uh, then be thou jo um, jocund, um, be merry, right? Um, uh, ere the bat hath flown his cloistered flight, ere the black Hecate's summons, the shard-born beetle with his drowsy hums hath rung night's yawning peal, there shall be done a deed of dreadful note. Uh, and Lady Macbeth says, what's to be done? So she, apparently she doesn't know that Macbeth has already plotted this whole thing out. Um, uh, he's got the murderer, so that's all on him, right? <laughs> um, uh, so he's kind of gone further, like, like uh, then l earlier in the play, she was kind of like taking care of loose ends and, and here Macbeth has totally um, done something without even telling her. Uh, uh, and Macbeth's response here is, be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck. Kind of just like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Don't worry your, don't worry your pretty little self about, about that. I've got it taken care of. Till thou applaud the deed. Um, and we see uh, this kind of moment of, um, I think a, a little moment of split going on in the trust of their marriage, right? Now it's a dark trust that they had to begin with, like, like uh, uh, so they were, you know, plotting murder, of course, but it's pretty interesting that it shows a kind of divergence in uh, Macbeth's trajectory um, here. Uh, he says, come sealing night, scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day, and with thy bloody and invisible hand cancel and tear to pieces the great bond which keeps me pale. Light thickens, and the crow makes wing to the rooky wood. Good things of day begin to droop and drowse, while night's black agents to their craze do rouse. Thou marvelest at my words, but hold thee still. Like, this is like a different kind of Macbeth, right? Um, uh, things bad begun make strong themselves by ill. So pretty, go with me. I got it taken care of. Let's go. 3.3. Um, uh, scene three. Uh, okay, this is the murderers. And basically we get the murder of Banquo and Fleance escapes. Here, um, I'm not going to dig too much into the language there. Uh, Act 3.4, um, we get the, this banquet that's happening, right? And this is like the first kind of big celebration of Macbeth as king, right? So this is a pretty important feast. Um, uh, and uh, um, so all the, these lords are here, Lennox and lords in attendance, um, and Ross, uh, Macbeth, uh, says, you know your own degrees, sit down. And he's speaking to everybody. You know, you know where you should sit um, according to your place, uh, to your rank in society. Um, uh, at first and last, the hearty welcome. Thanks to your majesty, they say. 
um, ourself. So Macbeth again using the royal um, we. Ourself will mingle with society and play the humble host. Our hostess keeps her state, but in best time we will require her welcome. Um, uh, Lady Macbeth says, pronounce it for me, sir, to all our friends, for my heart speaks. They are all welcome um, as well. So she chimes in, and then the, the murderers kind of come in. <laughs> I mean, Macbeth has to, he kind of sees them, uh, and he's still talking to everybody else, right? But, but, um, uh, uh, he says, see, they encounter thee with their hearts, thanks. Um, both sides are even. Here, I'll sit. And he's got a chair where he's going to sit in the midst of everybody. Um, uh, be in mirth, and anon we'll drink uh, a measure the table around. Um, uh, and then he, he goes and converses with the first murderer. And he's like, the first thing he says, like, there's blood upon your face. Like, <laughs> um, uh, the mur murderer says his Banquo's, and the murderer tells him that he's killed Banquo, but he hasn't they weren't able to get fleance, right? Uh, and Macbeth says, then comes my fit again. Uh, I had else been first perfect, or sorry, I had else been perfect. Whole as the marble, founded as the rock, as broad as the general, as casing, the casing air, but now I'm cabined, cribbed, confined, bound into saucy doubts and fears. Um, and so, like, this kind of extreme one way to the, the next. I was totally free, and now I'm a prisoner. Um, and uh, then he says, he says, well, you know, at least, you know, we can go after Fleance. Like, like he's, a tooth, he's toothless. Um, he's still young. We'll be able to get him. Um, and um, uh, Lady Macbeth is kind of talking to people, and, and, and then we see the ghost. Um, uh, um, uh, enter into the banquet and this is super important just to think about what ghosts are right so remember in an earlier lecture i said that um the protestant Christ christianity at the time and particularly you know king james and the anglican church of the time period would have done away with the idea of purgatory right as a place between heaven and hell where souls go until they can be cleansed and go to heaven, right? So it's like you've got some sins, but you didn't do your last confession for um, a Catholic um, religion. Um, and so you just have to like walk in purgatory for a while until your sins get cleansed. Or people can pray or do rosaries for you. The living can do that. And that was part of the, one of the things that was corrupt about the Catholic Church. Um, and w what caused part of the, the Protestant Reformation that had happened earlier um, in the, the 1500s um, was that really like like people like like when you say you have, you've got like a really nasty rich person um, who just treats everybody really mean and they're gonna die and they know that they um, have like not been charitable in their life um, they haven't been good Christians and so uh, what they do is they set up a chapel on their estate and they pay the salary of multiple generations of uh, priests to say mass for them like and to um, to sit to, to kind of basically pray on their behalf so that they're like yeah I'm gonna go to purgatory for a while but I'll be there but I've, I've, I've paid I've paid my debt and and eventually I'll go to heaven because um, I've, I've you know paid these priests to say mass for me for you know years and years ahead of <laughs> ahead of my time um and so there's a kind of corruption around uh, the idea that like and like that that like um and i think that that's part one of the reasons why the protestants were like nope you die and you don't go to purgatory you either go to heaven or you go to hell right it's just one like one way or the other and that's something that any kind of extremist religious movement is going to do and that's why protestants are called protesters right um they are religious extremists especially for the time period. Now there are people that are more extreme, like the Puritans, who will come in um, uh, later in the 1600s and depose the king himself, right? Because they don't think that the Anglican Church is Christian enough, and so uh, uh, there's a, a, a lot of religious strife and radicalism going on. And then you've got the radicalism of the, the Catholics who were trying to blow up a Parliament for the gunpowder plot at the time as well. So just to throw a ghost into your play at this point in time, it's like really, like there's a lot going on because like the ghost in the 
it's not that ghosts don't quite exist in the Protestant frame, but they're not purgatory people, right? They're, they're not like necessarily the spirit of the person. They would be manifestations of Satan or the devil. Um, uh, but also at the same time, like Shakespeare has set this play in pre-Christian times, in pagan times where you perhaps could have ghosts. And so like there's a bunch of ambiguity in the play and that's what allows Shakespeare to be showing like what would be truly demonic figures on stage, right? Um, like, like if these things are so evil, why would you celebrate it on stage, right? Um, like, like doesn't this art, just to go back to Socrates and Aristotle's argument, right? Like if we're going to have these stage plays with witches and devil worshiping basically going on on stage, Hecate is like the queen of the witches who shows up in the play. Um, and like, like, and of course it titillates people, right? <laughs> in the audience. Uh, and it's really, really creepy and it might inspire pity and terror in terms of Aristotle's stuff. But at the same time, it gets people's emotions right, riled up. And, and there's a lot of ambiguity going on with having a ghost on stage. Like ghosts are really, really important. Even when Harry Potter books came out in the 1990s, a big portion of Christian communities in the United States um, did not approve of the Harry Potter books because they dealt with magic and witchery, which is like for them devil worship. Um, now, by the end, if you've read all the Harry Potter books, right, like like book eight, and especially in the film, the kind of Christian imagery going on uh, at, at the end of the film, like shows that the story is actually quite Christian, um, uh, at least in the way that it's framed. Um, but there were lots of Christian groups so that, that this is not something that were that is that far away from us in time in terms of the ways that religion um, or religious folks think of things. And so I just think of that very recent example with Harry Potter. Um, uh, so the ghost comes in Banquo and he sits in Macbeth's place in the, in, in the chair that Macbeth remember he had designated that he has this chair uh, and um, uh, Lennox says, why don't you sit down, sir? And, and Macbeth doesn't see an empty chair. He's like, um, he's like, here, here we had, uh, here had we now our country's honor roofed, um, were the graced person of Banquo present, um, who may I ch rather challenge for unkindness than pity for mischance? Um, and uh, this is interesting. This is something that Macbeth keeps doing during this scene where he hasn't quite noticed that Banquo's there yet, that there's a ghost there yet, but he's invoked him already. So there's this question, I think, of whether or not he's invoking the dead by saying the dead's name and saying, oh, like, because he knows that he's dead, but he's like lying to everybody and saying like, oh, well, what, what if... Why, why isn't Banquo here tonight? Um, and Ross says, his absence, sir, lays blame upon his promise. Please, your highness, grace uh, to grace us with your royal company. And Macbeth sees that his place is occupied here and the table's full. And uh, he says, and Lennox says, no, you've got a reserved place right here. And Macbeth says, where? Uh, and um, they point out the seat and the ghost is sitting in it. And uh, Macbeth starts talking directly to the ghost, which apparently no one, no one can see but him. And he says, thou canst not say I did it. Like, never shake thy gory locks at me, right? I didn't, I wasn't your murderer, um, which is a lie. He's the one who orchestrated the whole thing, but he's like, he's just saying, well, my hand didn't do it, right? Um, it's a moment, um, pro possibly a moment of equivocation, right? If you remember from the earlier... Um, lecture, um, uh, a kind of bending of the words to, to, to make a different kind of truth. Uh, and Lady Macbeth sort of jumps in here, and this, this came up in earlier um, uh, readings as well, that, that Macbeth, um, or earlier acts, that Macbeth has, has, has a long history of having these moments of these fits of visions. The, the floating dagger, for example, in, in um, Act Two, 
So uh, Lady Macbeth says, Sit, worthy friends, my lord is often thus and hath been from his youth. Uh, pray you, keep seat. Um, the fit's momentary upon a thought he will be again, uh, uh, again be well. If you note him, if much you note him, you shall offend him and extend his passion. So like, don't feed into this, this fit that he's in. And then she pulls him aside, right? And she's like, are you a man? Like the, the language of masculinity. I, <laughs> uh, and a bold one uh, that dare look upon that which might appall the devil. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, he's still owning his manhood, right? But he's like, he's like, this is a demon. This is like, this is a demon that might scare the devil. Um, uh, and Lady Macbeth kind of like strikes it off. Oh, proper stuff. This is the very painting of your fear. This is the air drawn dagger, which you said led you to Duncan. Oh, these flaws and starts, imposters to true fear w would well become a woman's story at a winter's fire authorized by her grandam, by her grandmother. It's like, like, like you're, you're, you say you're a man, but you're acting womanly right now. Shame itself. Why do you make such faces when all's done? You look but on a stool. Uh, and he's, Macbeth is saying, pretty, no, like there, like, I'm, don't you see it? Behold you? How say you? Um, and he talks to the ghost again. If thou canst not speak too. If charnel houses and our graves must send those that we bury back, our monuments shall be the maws of kites. Our monuments should be the guts of scavenger birds. Right. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, again, Lady Macbeth is not hearing any of this. Fie for shame. Macbeth says, blood hath been shed ere now in the olden time. This is really interesting, this moment where he's reflecting back into olden times. But of course, he's in olden times, right? Because the play is set in this pre-Christian era. But he himself is reflecting. He's, he's saying, blood hath been shed before now in the olden time. Um, before humane statute purged the gentle wheel, I and since two murders have been performed, too terrible for the ear. The times has been that when the brains were out, that men would die and there an end, but now they rise again. This is so interesting. Now we're living in a different time of these spirits. And is he talking about now, now in his time, or is he talking about now with Christianity and all of this stuff? Is this Shakespeare writing kind of behind Macbeth and Shakespeare's voice coming in and questioning like all of the kinds of ways that spirits and superstition are clouding the, and murking the air itself right it's a po it's possible to read that little moment of dissent there um the, but the way that it's channeled through macbeth and macbeth's situation it distances it enough from shakespeare himself that uh it might be sort of coded and you can have an audience of people like king james who's like super christian um uh it, it thinks of himself anyways as super christian writes his book on demonology and witches uh and, and, and he doesn't get offended. So that's the trick. How do you, how do you put all this gory stuff on stage but um, still get away with it? Um, uh, but now they rise again with 20 mortal murders on their crowns and push us from our stools. This is more strange than such a murder can be. Um, and Lady Macbeth is telling them, don't listen to him, don't pay attention. <laughs> um, uh, and... Uh, Macbeth kind of comes out of his trance here. He says, I do forget. Do not muse at me, my most worthy friends. I have a strange infirmity, which is nothing to those that know me. Come, love and health to all. Then I'll sit down. Give me some wine. Fill full. It's like, okay. <laughs> I have just had this fit. Um, don't mind me. Just give me another glass of wine. Because that's going to help. <laughs> uh, enter the ghost here. And then he says, I drink to the general joy of the, to the whole table. And to our dear friend Banquo. So again, he channels Banquo. Like, what the hell? <laughs> whom we whom we miss, right? Uh, would he would he were here? To all him we thirst, uh, and all to all. And um, uh, then the ghost shows up, and then he's like, "Get out of my sight!" Like, it, like so he starts freaking out again. And Lady Macbeth is like, um, you know, trying to handle things here. Um, 
Uh, but she says, think of this, good peers, but as the thing of custom, tis no other, only it spoils the pleasure of the time. Um, Macbeth says, what man dare I dare? So he's owning this kind of masculinity thing again. Um, he's like, like approach, like bring me like a Russian bear, a rhinoceros, a hurricane tiger, take any shape but that, and my firm nerves shall never tremble or be alive again and dare me to desert with thy sword. He's talking to the ghost, right? Um, uh, if trembling I inhabit them, protest me, the baby of a girl. Hence, horrible shadow, unreal mockery, hence, like get away from me. Like, or like come to life, I'll fight you. Like, like in real life, I'll fight tigers, I'll fight anything real, but I can't fight you in the way that you are. And then this interesting, like the ghost leaves at his request, like he says, get out of here. And then why so being gone, I am a man again. So there's this kind of level of like humanity. He's transcending and moving out of humanity and back into manhood um, uh, throughout the play. Um, uh, and then, you know, basically like the party's kind of ruined at this point, everybody kind of disperses and we get this other kind of soliloquy going on um, with, with Macbeth. And this is a pretty important one too. It's just, it will have blood, they say. Blood will have blood. Stones have been known to move and trees to speak. Augurs, the people who interpret omens or the guts of birds, which is the way, or divination. Um, uh, uh, this is the way people told for futures and fortunes in the ancient world. Um, uh, it will have blood, they say. Blood will have blood. Stones have been known to move and trees to speak. Augurs and understood relations have by maggot pies and chops and rooks brought forth the secretest man of blood. What is the night? What time is it? So and Lady Macbeth's here. And she says it's almost the morning time. And um, he wonders where Macduff is because like Macduff, uh, like, um, uh, uh, um, he's, he's worried about who's, what side Macduff is going to take in all of this. Um, Lady Macbeth says, did you send to him, sir? And he sa Macbeth says, I hear it, by the way, but I will send. Um, there's not a one of them, but in this house I keep a servant feed. Um, I will tomorrow and betimes. And, and so, like, by sending people, like, you know, that basically they're plotting murder again, right? So this kind of paranoia is showing up. Like, so he's got to take care of Banquo. Now he's probably got to take care of Macbeth, or, or sorry, of Macduff. Um, uh, I'll send them. Uh, there's not a one of them that I, I don't, I've, I've people paid to do this sort of thing. I will tomorrow and betimes I will to the weird sisters. More shall they speak for now I am bent to know by the worst means the worst. For mine own good, all causes shall give way. And so there's that balancing, that challenging of fate again. I'm going to go. I'm going to find out the rest of it. But it's all going to be for like my way. I want to, and, and he says, I am in blood, stepped in so far that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as goer, go o go o'er or over. Um, so I might as well just keep going. There's no turning back now. Like, we'll kill Macduff, we'll like, kill Macduff's kids, like, we'll, we'll do whatever we need to do. And I'm going to go see the Weird Sisters to figure that out what to do. <clears throat> Strange things I have in head that will will to hand, which must be acted before they may be scanned. Um, you lack the season of all nature's sleep, says Lady Macbeth. There's, the, there's that sleeplessness. She's like, you're acting crazy because you haven't slept. Um, come, we need to go to sleep. Um, my strange and self-abuse is the initiate fear that wants hard use. We are yet, but young indeed. It's like we need to rest. We need to like recover ourselves, but we've got a lot of things to do. So we get this shift to Acts um, uh, 3.5. Sometimes scholars want, have wondered whether or not Shakespeare actually wrote this, but I'm approaching it as if he did. And there are arguments in both ways. I just wanted to throw that in there for scholars that scholars have sometimes debated. Um, and this is where Hecate shows up, so kind of queen of the witches, and she's chiding the weird sisters um, for not letting her know that, that all of these things that they've been doing. 
Um, uh, so like the first witch asks her like, why are you angry? Um, and look at the pattern of the way that the language shows up again, right? This, the, the verse that they use is that incantation. It's the language of spells. It's poetry, it's a kind of poetry, but it's the incantation itself that lends poetry to being enchanted, right? To display a kind of enchantment. Um, so it's really different. Remember like the, the lower class guys talk in prose. Sometimes there's this lofty speech of kings. Uh, and now we have this kind of, um, this, this swaying back and forth. So let me read some of it aloud to get so you can hear it. Have I not reasoned beldams as you are, saucy and overbold? How did you dare to trade and traffic with Macbeth and riddles and affairs of death? And I, the mistress of your charms, the close contriver of all harms. So these couplets, right? These rhyming couplets at the end. Um, I, the mistress of your charms, the close contriver of all harms, was never called to bear my part or show the glory of our art. And which is worse, all you've done have been but for a wayward son, spiteful and wrathful, who, as others do, loves for his own ends, not for you, but make amends now. Get you gone, and at the pit of Asheron, the river in Hades, meet me in the morning, uh, thither he will come to know his destiny. Um, so she, she's like, she's like, one of the things she's sort of like pissed about, like, first of all, they didn't come to her and talk to her about what they're going to do. And they're like, and, and she's kind of blaming it on the weird sister. She's saying like, why are you messing with this guy who didn't really ever do anything? And so this as like, as audience members, it's like, whoa, like, you know, is it Macbeth's fault? Is it all the doings of the weird sisters? And Hecate's like, 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 what's this spiteful kind of wrath? And this is something crazy about the play Macbeth. It's so dark and it's just like really unjust and screwed up. Like, like that, that like, you know, there are just these entities out there that will just screw with your life just because they're bored or they don't have anything better to do. Right. Um, and that they can ruin everything. They can turn people into murderers. They can send people down the, like this, these path. Like, like it's very disturbing on a certain level. Um, uh, so the, he, she's like, the, he's going to come tomorrow. He's going to like want to know his destiny. She says, your vessels and your spells provide your charms and everything beside. I'm for the air. This night I'll spend unto a dismal and a fatal end. Great business must be wrought ere, ere noon upon the corner of the moon. There hangs a vaporous drop profound. I'll catch it ere and come to ground. And that distilled by magic slights shall raise the artificial sprites as by the strength of their illusion shall draw him to his confusion. He shall spurn fate. He's going to say, I can do it myself. I'm going to spurn fate, which he's already been doing. He scorn death. I'm not afraid of death and bear his hopes above wisdom, grace, and fear. And you all know security is mortal's chiefest enemy. Security is the mortal's chiefest. The, the idea that we have things figured out is our worst enemy as humans. And that's what they're going to play on is his need to know how things are going to be. And then they start dancing, music and song. And they've called up all these sprites and there's this kind of like devilish dance going on. Uh, hark, I'm called a little spirit sea, sits in a foggy cloud and stays for me. And so she leaves off to go hang out with the sprite. Uh, come, let's make haste. She'll soon be back again, says the one of the witches. And then we get this in 3.6 here. We get uh, uh, another conversation between lords this time, so between Lennox and between um, another lord. And so here, the, this kind of mid, middle level, they're, they're like, you know, kind of the upper class discussion in their perspective. And like the Lennox is kind of trying to justify like why Macbeth is king and at, here at the beginning here. But the other Lord is basically saying, yeah, well, actually it looked sketchy that um, Donald Bain and Malcolm uh, ran off after their father was killed. But uh, it seems like like Macduff um, has has something else in mind and, and they've gone to England um, they've met up in England and they're they're regrouping and they're gonna come back and and um, 
we take things and um uh uh and so 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 then um the kind of perspective of the noblemen shift right and they're like oh well you know i hope they hurry up because things are going crazy up here in scotland and there's a weird kind of sense that like you don't know how much time has passed at this point in the in the, in the play um uh like so it could have been like kind of like months have gone by here and and macbeth has just been being king um and because it takes i mean that has to take a long time to go you know multiple days at least to go to england and then they've been staying there and at first donald bain seems to have gone to ireland but now he's come back and they've called up macduff um and macduff has been laying low but uh macbeth has has his um sights out for him uh and so um we get the end of at the end of act three here we get this sh this that you're getting a kind of shift in the noble people's perspective about whether or not they're going to side with macbeth um, who is their king and so there's this distrust that's going on in Macbeth's um, place and sovereignty so we'll end there that's the end of act three and I'll do another video for act four um, and we'll just carry on with this stuff uh, uh, take care and see you in the next video